The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to the Autism Network and this very special edition of Autism Live. We're preempting Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy to bring you a very special event. You know that from time to time, we welcome Dr. Temple Grandin to be with us live and she is with us right now. Good morning, Dr. Grandin and welcome. Great to be here. We love having you here. I don't know if you saw that opener, Dr. Grandin. That is our new opener for Autism Live that was designed top to bottom, including the music and all the graphics and the animation by individuals that were on the autism spectrum. We're very proud Good. to present. And that was done in conjunction okay. with Spectrum Laboratory. So we're, we're really happy that we're now employing folks that are on the spectrum to do uh, artwork and stuff for it. So I know, I, I, I thought you would find that interesting. No, that's and just exciting. great. That's wonderful. And we're excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, we are live right now on a lot of different platforms. We are, we're live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and about a dozen other places. Traven will try to show you some of those as the program progresses. We do encourage interaction. I will tell you that we asked for all the questions that we were going to ask Dr. Grandin to be sent in early. You guys heard that call and we have tons of questions. I don't think we're going to get any anywhere near half of them. You can feel free to uh, to write in on those platforms live and, and say hi to Dr. Grandin, but we're going to take the questions that were sent in in advance. Um, so thank you all for, for writing in your questions. Dr. Grandin, I, I'm, I'm just going to leap in unless you have any statements that you want to make here at the start of the show. Well, it's just really great to be here. And we're going to talk about navigating autism. Yeah, and Deborah uh, Moore came up with a really good word. It's called a label locking, where you get so locked into the label, you can't see your child in any other way. And I think it's really important to look at the whole child. And that's one of the major themes of the book is there's a whole child there. It's not just the label. Don't get locked into it. Can we see the, the, the cover of the new book? I think you've got it right there. Navigating yeah. Autism. And so uh, a lot of emphasis on um, uh, getting a child out in the real world. That's extremely important um, because there's a tendency for a lot of parents to overprotect their kids. I'm seeing too many kids that aren't learning shopping. I just ran into one just the other day on the phone. Uh, just the most basic things that I learned is a very young child. Also, a lot of emphasis on developing strengths. And I've always been a big proponent of that. My ability in art was always um, encouraged all the time. Wonderful. And we've got some questions that are, are right in the line uh, with what you're talking about. But navigating autism, I assume we can get it at every major bookseller. Yes, you can get it to every major bookseller uh, or yeah. online. They would all have it. Okay. Parker, I want to start off with Parker's question. He says, what do you think is the recommendation for kids with ASD, ADHD to improve focus and attention or specific activities that will help if meds are not an option? Well, exercise. Let's just start with some of the simple things. Um, <clears throat> I make sure I do a hundred sit-ups every day. I despise every one of them, but that burst of hard exercise definitely helps. Mother used to say, Go outside and run the energy out of you. That's something that can be really, really helpful. That can be helpful. Also, getting kids interested in things also can help on attention. I notice a lot of kids, they have no problem attending the video games. And I get very concerned about the um, video game addictions because these kids are not going on and becoming great video designers. If that was what was happening, I wouldn't be uh, complaining about it. No, they're ending up in the basement just playing video games. Um, and there's been some successes with uh, weaning them off the video games, this is when they were adults, to car mechanics, because it's my kind of thinker, the visual thinker, that also likes mechanical things. Absolutely. And I, I messed up. That question was actually from Angela. Parker's question was, what are the best ways to te teach job skills for people on the spectrum? I imagine there's a little bit of overlap there with those questions. 
Well, yes. I mean, let's, okay, we've got kids in the pipeline right now. I'll give recommendations for that. <clears throat> but I want to make it emphasize. It's never too late to start with an adult. Never too late to start because there's been three adult video game addicts that weaned off with car mechanics. And one of them right now is fixing trains for the railroad. And they love them. And there's another kid uh, that I just saw his picture. I was at an industry meeting. And now he's got bushy hair, baseball cap, ADHD, somewhat autistic. He is now repairing tools for a tool company. Very, very successful. And he pays plenty of attention to that because it's something that he is interested in. You see, my mind doesn't think in broad generalities. My mind thinks in specific examples. I'm learning more and more about how the verbal thinker in education thinks very differently than I do. They have a broad concept like job skills, where I tend to use specific examples, either my own or somewhere else, somebody else to illustrate a point because I'm a bottom up thinker. Think putting individual subjects in slots on a spreadsheet. That is how I think. So let's say kids in the pipeline now, let's um, start doing chores around age five, clearing the table, just simple things like that. Then when they get around 11, that's where we got to find a time for the paper route substitute because we don't have paper routes anymore. And there are a lot of granddads that discover they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed and they had a paper route. So around 11, how about church volunteer jobs? How about farmer's market volunteer jobs? Tasks done on schedule where somebody outside the family is the boss. That is really important. Instant, they're legal. I want real jobs. Instant. I don't want to think about it. We're going to do real jobs. And let's talk about some of the things that will not work. Let me tell you where I won't put them. This is on the bad spreadsheet box. Busy McDonald's takeout window. Too much multitasking. We don't put them there. Super crazy wrapping station at Christmas time in a store. Don't put them there. Those two are failures. Okay, let's look at some that worked. Okay, bagging groceries. Um, office supply store selling printers and other equipment was successful. Ice cream shop's been successful because you work with each uh, customer at the time. These are actual real cases where parents had some very great successes. Um, instant illegal. They need to get a real job. I want to get the transition to work done before they graduate from high school. I don't want to think about it. We're going to do it and forget the regular interview process. Let's go in the back door. Let's just use our connections. I'm going to give you another case of a success. One that I learned about this spring. These are recent ones. This person works at a food safety lab, a big national food safety lab. And his job is to receive the samples of food. They check it for E. coli, salmonella, all kinds of bad things like that. And it's very important it's done right. Not to mix up the samples. That would be a disaster not to cross contaminate the samples, they love him. And it was just gotten through the networking, uh, family, uh, friends. It was just gotten that way. And these are examples of real jobs that have been successful. And, and uh, that's what we need to be doing. Okay, let's say we have somebody that hasn't had a job, let's say he's mid twenties, video game addict. Now I'm not saying car mechanics is for everybody. But the visual thinkers like me, the object visualizers, often really like mechanical things. And, and uh, there have been three successes with um, car mechanics. So mm -hmm. I'm going to tend to push that. And I think there's a reason for it. Because my kind of mind is most likely to get addicted to video games. And uh, the visual thinkers like me, we like art and graphics. Okay, you showed your new um, uh, logo there in the beginning. And also like mechanics. And when I was out in the meat plants, we were installing equipment. I worked with skilled tradespeople and machinery designers that were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. Some of them owned shops and had multiple patents. You know, these, this is all real stuff. And, and so we had to find a substitute for the video games. Now, another problem I see in jobs is uh, autism is such a broad field. I mean, uh, by, by the way, you know, Elon Musk is on the autism spectrum. This is Ashley Vance's book. And you see those post-it notes? I put those in there when that book was first published because I thought he was autistic. Now, now I can say it. Those are like five or six-year-old post-it notes. 
they've been there for a while. I love that. But it, love it. And then you've got someone who can't, uh, you know, that's nonverbal. Now, this is where we get a problem with a job like bagging groceries. A lot of people don't differentiate to where that's a training job, one summer training job and where it is a suitable career. There's some individuals where it would be a suitable career. For someone like me, it would not be a suitable career. You see, Absolutely. I'm seeing that differentiation being made. So I want to add to your list that uh, my son, I, I followed your advice, and the summer that my son turned 16, he uh, was a camp counselor in training at the Ed Asner Family Center. And then this last summer, he was a, a full camp counselor. So um, we love the Ed Asner Family Center and how they've made that a possibility for individuals on the spectrum. And now my son has graduated to a job where um, he's a union actor in the scare maze over at uh, Universal Studios. And I've noticed good, that good. there's a lot of um, young people that are interested in acting and voiceover. Yes. By the way, today uh, is the second season of uh, uh, Lock and Key debuts on Netflix featuring Kobe Bird, fabulous actor on the spectrum. Encourage everybody to watch that. But we're seeing more and more people interested in that. How do you feel about that, Temple? I think that's wonderful. And I'm going to talk about a few of these chat items that have come up here. Okay. Um, ASD wrote in here. Uh, okay, maybe that's not the name. I'm sorry. That's we okay. make video games with using vocabulary as a way of teaching speaking. If that works for you, do it. Because I don't recommend a total elimination of video games. What I'm recommending is severely limiting the time spent just playing video games. Because okay. some individuals get friends through video games. It, but it's got to be limited. Because I'll tell you what I don't want to see. Eight hours a day on a video game and nothing else. Um, and then another uh, person wrote in here about the importance of real world experience. That's a whole chapter in navigating autism. We've got to prepare kids for the real world. I cannot emphasize that enough. Yes. Rianne wants to know, I've heard you say that you spun a metal ring on your bed and that you like to watch sand go through your fingers. What does that do for you? I want to understand why my son splashes water. Well, I would study the grains of sand like a scientist studying something under a microscope, you know, looking at how the little individual particles fell. And then when I spun the brass plate that covered the bolt on the bed, on the bed frame, I would spin it different ways and watch how it would, you know, do this, you know, like just study very different ways that it would spin. That's what I did. I also want to answer this question here in the chat about industry partners. We're going to, that's too top down. That's too broad. We do it one company at a time. We've got to work on these things in the neighborhood where they, okay, the food safety lab, for example, I, it's actually one of my clients and they have several different food safety labs. And this can be an avenue for getting more people doing this. Wonderful. Because that job of receiving samples, that's a really responsible job. And that autistic person attends to that detail and he'll never mix them up and he'll never cross contaminate them. Yes, we love Those that. Those are two really, really important things. You see, and that's a specific example. See, my mind doesn't work in generalities. I'm seeing specific things of successes, specific things like the busy wrapping station. That would be a disaster. Um, that would be bad. Also, you know, he's handling the samples one at a time. It doesn't involve multitasking. And you're not getting 600 of these a day. It isn't, you know, it's a little lower volume than that. Angela had a follow-up question. When you were in elementary school, what were your challenges as a kid and how did you manage it? Or did the school help you? Well, mother uh, got together with a small school, mother and the teachers working together. Parents and teachers need to be on the same team. Because over and over again, I have heard, oh, he's horrible at school and wonderful at home. Well, wonderful at home and horrible to school. Mm -hmm. Well, that's when they better get together and find out what's going on there. So elementary school was good. It was a small school. Now, high school is a disaster. I got kicked out of a regular high school because a girl called me a retard and I threw a book at her. And I ended up going to special school for kids with problems. And they put me to work running their horse barn. And I cleaned nine stalls every day and I put the horses in and out and I wasn't doing any studying. Now they made me attend classes. There was no recluses in the room. I had to attend class 
had to attend meals. They didn't care about the studying at this point. Though I did have one class I actually did study, and that was biology, because I found that really interesting. But I learned how to work. I can't emphasize how important that is. And you take someone like Elon Musk, he learned how to work at a really young age. He wasn't playing video games. He was making them and selling them. You see how that's a different approach. He's also just old enough. As I checked out the games he would have played based on his age, just old enough to have avoided the most addictive games. Yeah. And they've been designed to be addictive. Yes, absolutely. Well, to follow up on some of what you said, uh, one of our viewers wanted to know, how did you handle bullies? What did you do with the feelings of when they made fun of you? It was horrible. And I got in fights at my new school and I had to switch from anger to crying. You don't get in trouble for crying. You get in trouble for anger. Who I mean, taught I you that or did you figure that out for yourself? It just happened. It mm. just happened after horseback riding got taken away for about two weeks. Mm. It just happened. Mm. And the only places I had friends was friends through shared interests. This is what we got to do with these kids. It, you know, it could be many different things. It could be music. It could be uh, acting in a play. It could be art. It could be woodworking. It could be welding. It could be cooking. Um, for me, it was horseback riding model rockets and electronics lab those were the three places where i had friends okay and really that's important. really important it is important karen wants to know when you went to college did you have any accommodations what kind of and what kind of accommodations do you make for your students and do you have students that are on the spectrum uh there were no formal accommodations made um i got stuck in a room with uh two other roommates, that was a disaster. Mm. And um, they put me in a room with one roommate. That was a whole lot better. Uh, they kind of knew that they were gonna have to work with me. It was all very, very informal. But one thing I did, and this is something a lot of students fail to do. I was very bad in math. And when I failed my first math quiz, I asked for help. Mm. I cannot emphasize how important that is. Biggest mistake that students make in the flunking out of school is they don't ask for help soon enough. Now I've got my professor hat on right now on this. Yeah. And this is something I've seen over and over again. Now I've had autistic um, students in my classroom. Um, uh, then I had some that, you know, they want to take their test over in the testing center. Um, well, now all my stuff's now gotten out online now, but for 30 years, I kept my tests off of off of electronic media so they couldn't archive them online i'm now i'm sure they're archived online i can't do anything about it i uh, i said no you're not going to do it at the testing center we have a very nice conference room with natural lighting so we won't have any issues with the led lights and you're going to take it there yeah you know yeah. i it, the law says reasonable accommodation and right. and i've had a blind student in my class i've had a student in a wheelchair in my class we had to change the building we had the class in we i did that and the blind student obviously couldn't do my drawing assignment. So I gave her a paper to write. Okay. Because okay. there was no way a blind student could do a drawing. Yeah. And and just, um, you know, I want to do everything I can to help students. I had a student with autism call me just before I got on the Zoom call. You're going to talk to her this afternoon because I want to help her to be successful. But uh, uh, you know, I had a I had a I had a really neat student that he could make any animal sound there was. <laughs> and accurately? Accurately, yes. I couldn't believe it. I love that. Uh, there's a place for him in the voiceover world. Tilda wants to know which of your books should I read first? I'm 22 and I am autistic. I probably would not read Navigating Autism. Navigating Autism is really, really good for a parent who gets diagnosed and then and then I've got the way I see it. This would be the how-to book. Okay, you read you read Navigating Autism so you don't completely freak out and you know how to deal with it. Then you read this one for the instructions. For an older person, I would actually recommend Different Not Less because mm -hmm. this is 18 people in their own words. I was the editor for this book. In their own words, uh, telling about their life. I actually learned a lot from that. Yeah. And where the diagnosis helped in that situation was relationships. For a lot of older people, diagnosis was a huge relief. I'm seeing in kids, especially fully verbal ones, the diagnosis holding them back, actually. Mm -hmm. 
they're getting label locked. Single most important thing that Deborah said in this, she invented this term label locking. Really important. Also, this book's got some great chapters on medical conditions associated with autism, gastrointestinal, skin problems, other conditions, uh, psychiatric conditions, anxiety, OCD. Uh, they have this, doctors have this awful word, comorbid. I hate that word. I'd rather call them coexisting. That's yes. That's the way an engineer might say it. I prefer that. Yes. And I don't like the word morbid either. Comorbid. I mean, it sounds like it's half dead or something. I don't know. Exactly. Um, because morbidity is sickness, mortality is death, I guess, in medicine. Maybe. Yeah. Not very nice terms. But it's important to recognize that, you know, that, you know some of these things are associated. Because I have a lot of problems with anxiety. And I, and in my book, Thinking in Pictures, I talk about how medication helped me. And that can get to be a controversial subject, but I don't think I'd be here without medication. I got a whole chapter in Thinking in Pictures about my experiences with anxiety. It was burning me up all through 20s, getting worse and worse and worse. I did the dip fat project shown in the movie without the medication. It went on in my early 30s. I don't think I'd be here without the medication. Wow. I don't have any innards left. Wow. I, I got colitis so bad that I was counting calories in yogurt to mm. make sure I ate enough so I wouldn't lose too much weight. Wow. And I can remember doing that. Well, I, I want to know what you did to change that. And Samuel has written in and said, how do you deal with change? It's been very hard for me in the pandemic. And we see that for a lot of folks. They're really struggling with anxiety as a result of the pandemic. Well, so knowledge, what did you do? knowledge is power. When I was a child, I had a little notebook and it said, all the notebooks our school gave out had knowledge as power on it. Well, you know what I did? Every way to treat COVID, I read about. Every mm -hmm. scientific paper on COVID, I read. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy about old treatments, so I'm not going to discuss them because they're too politically charged. Yeah. I stockpiled some of the stuff. I went deep, deep into the science. And I was very careful not to get COVID. The Delta variant hadn't come out. I I did. I went to Lamb Feed Yard. We have a meat a meat lab on campus. I used to go over there, very very carefully, staying away from everybody. I go look at the cattle, just to have something to do. And I think I could have treated COVID if I got it. Okay. And I can't go into any more than that That's because right. of the controversy surrounding it. But I am a very good surfer when it comes to scientific literature and i know how to separate the bs from the real stuff so the knowledge in the case of knowledge COVID. knowledge something now i just finished was reading an article i'm working on a, a paper on visual thinking and how people do management let's read this paper here about two different managers on the fukushima nuclear power plant disaster one manager there were two stations the one totally trashed and another station they managed to prevent totally badness from happening, even though it was wrecked. Um, one manager gave his employees all the knowledge, every bit of knowledge, knowledge on the earthquake, knowledge on what was wrecked in the plant. The other manager sitting in an office uh, several miles away on a TV monitor. He was the suit. Oh, look at this cool thing I got. This came from one of our local meat plants. He's got a cow <laughs> suit right there. I just had to get this squeezy toy. And <laughs> I'm going to squeeze the suit. And, <laughs> and so one of the managers was a total suit, thinking he could do it from a windowless control room. The other guy's out there telling his people everything. Yeah, the basement's flooded. There's fish swimming in the basement. You know, the emergency cooling pump is underwater, and there's fish swimming over it right now. Uh, we're really in trouble. But he gave his people all of the information. And for me, that helped. Uh, instant vaccines were available. I got them instantly, instantly. Uh, yeah. When I got my first shot, it was like, oh, I'm going to have freedom. Yeah. That's going to be really wonderful. Yeah. But I seem to recall you had some pretty funky uh, dreams that night, too. Well, yeah, I did. I had a, I had an airport anxiety dream because I knew I was, I'd been grounded for a whole year. I couldn't fly, obviously, because of the I, I didn't want to take, I, I, did, I learned about maybe ways that might be able to treat COVID, but on the other hand, I didn't want to risk it. Yeah. I wasn't going to test the knowledge, let's put it that way. So I was not ready to get on an airplane until I was fully vaccinated. 
There you and go. So I got my first shot, and then I dreamed that I went to the one of the, some airport somewhere, and I left my wallet in a restaurant, and I got it back. All of the cards were missing: my license, credit cards, my school ID, everything. And I was just ready, ready to look where the money was, and I woke up. Oh, very good, very good. Thank goodness it was just a nightmare, and not reality, because canceling was, all those cards. Not well, fun. I can tell you, losing a wallet, I've been through that. Oh, it's terrible, isn't it? And it and it lasts for months. But Matilda wants to know, we're trying to teach my son the multiplication tables and I'm not sure what to do. I had to memorize it as a kid, but that doesn't seem to be working. How did you learn the multiplication tables and do you have any suggestions? For well, you have to learn that multiplication is a form of adding. Okay. Okay. So let's say we get some pennies. Now make sure that the, the coins are pennies. And if I take five pennies down and five pennies this way and I make a grid. I have 25 pennies. That's five times five. You see, I think by doing that, that will show you that it's a form of adding. See, then it, then it makes sense. That, that kind of stuff helped me. Also okay. learning fractions. My teacher had a pair, a wood pair that was cut in half and then wood apple that was cut in fourths. Or just cutting up a pizza. That's fractions. Yeah. I've, I've seen teachers teach it with a pizza really well. And, and, and it starts with just the pizza and they separate it, but then they go into toppings and say, we're going to put mushrooms on one eighth of the pizza. And I don't know why that seems to work with kids. If you pair it with food. It's real. Yeah. It's real. And you're, yeah. you're putting it back to something that's real and something right. they can relate to. So you're going to put, toppings on on one eighth of you know it's basically one slice of the pizza wonderful uh grace wants to say to you bless you dr grand and you've helped me so much with my son and i think that that a lot of people uh would agree with grace gloria wants to know do you sensitivity to clothing are there some things you don't wear my son will only wear short pants and takes his shoes off whenever he can yes i have very problems with scratchy clothes and i also have problems with <coughs> noise loud noise like the school bell going off now one of the ways you can help a kid get over the noise sensitivity is let the kid turn on the thing that scares whether it's the vacuum cleaner the uh, uh hair dryer and there was one case where a kid was terrified of the buzzer on the scoreboard at the gym they took him down to the gym when no one was there and let him play with the button mm. and he started tapping out tunes on it mm. when i was a kid i was terrified of this horn on this ferry boat you know what they should have done to me they should have taken me up where the captain was when we come into the harbor. Let me pull it. <laughs> you see, when you're given control, okay, now we have the issue of headphones. If you wear them all the time, your brain will get more sensitive. It's going to get worse. So what you want to do is have them with you. So you have control, but try not to wear them. But they're okay. with you. And then there's certain really awful noisy places where you're going to put them on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think all of us could use, like, I can't go into a casino. It's too much noise for me. Well, I can go into a casino, but I can't carry around a conversation at a casino because I can't yeah. screen out the background noise. Clothing, I had problems switching from shorts to long pants because I didn't like the new feeling of the long pants. So I just wear long sleeves all the time. And then I don't have to worry about what it feels like when, it's, when I switch. So my work clothes and my dress clothes basically feel the same. And a lot right now, like especially like girls' clothes, they've got these little leggings that are stylish. Now, I would have worn those. You would have? Yes, absolutely. I would have loved them. I look at those and I think, oh, man, they have for girls' clothes was so much more comfortable. No, I, 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 I really, really liked leggings because I don't like the feeling of skin going against skin. I don't like that. Interesting. And I, I look at those leggings and I think about when I was a child, I would have really liked them. Also, you need to wash clothing before you wear it because it's got you know, chemicals and stuff in it. It's irritating. Wash yeah. everything. But anything goes, well, not a winter jacket, obviously, but anything that goes against the skin. I agree. Okay, so they want to know, did you watch Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos go into space? And did you watch Shatner go into space the other day? What did you think? Do you want to go? Do you think that they should be called astronauts for only going up for 10 minutes? We want it, We want the skinny on this. Well, I definitely would want to go. I'd like to go on, the, on a few orbits. I really would like to do that. If I got a chance to do that, I would. And you know what? I would have gone into aerospace. I love space. 
but I couldn't do higher math. I couldn't do it. Mm. So I had to go into an industry where I could do engineering without the math. And then I discover all these people building all this clever equipment that makes a food processing plant run. Some of them barely graduated from high school and own metal fabrication companies. They have patents. They're selling equipment around the world. And I'm very concerned that this um, algebra requirement screening out so many kids. Uh, you need to have your old fashioned arithmetic the way it used to be taught uh, in the 50s. That's unique. Like find the area of a circle so I can size pneumatic cylinders. Yeah, that I have to have that. That I know how to do. But algebra is just too abstract. And you need the visual thinkers in engineering. And, you know, to prevent problems. Uh, the Fukushima nuclear power plant melted down because it didn't have watertight doors. And I was just reading articles this morning. Now they had fish swimming in the basement. After the doors had been smashed out. Now that's um, um, you know, a visual thinker would have said, wait a minute, you need to install watertight doors. Yeah. You see, I want engineers calculate risk, visual thinkers see risk. I want to know how long the fish lived in the basement because I, I'm assuming they were exposed to a fair amount of radiation. Well, um, not if not at first, they would not have been. Okay. It has right. to melt down before that happens. No, so, well, go ahead. Sorry. No, I mean, eventually they'd be fried with radiation, but not right off. But um, it, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but between the Jeff Bezos spaceship and the Elon Musk, if they were going to send you into space, if both of them offered Temple and said, would you like to go with me? Would you be able to pick between the two or you'd be happy to I go with either we'll, one? Uh, we'll we'll leave, not answer that question. Okay. All right. Uh, but you would go if somebody asked you. Oh, you I would go. I would go. And you no, wouldn't I'm be at all afraid? No. I could probably got a bigger risk of getting a car accident um, drive they take me from the hotel to the launch pad. <laughs> I love it. Did I, had, you... I was at the airport the other going to the airport just the other day, and there was a piece of metal catwalk material on the highway that came off of a vehicle that transports cars. And I ran over it. Oh dear. And I had another time where a gigantic board came off a trailer and I managed to avoid it. Wow. That potentially could have been a deadly accident. Absolutely. I think the, Absolutely. the airport's much more dangerous. There you go. I love this question from Barbara. When you visualize one of the buildings you design, do you see it from above first or can you see it from all angles at the same time? Can you describe your process? Your drawings are stunning. Basically, I can position myself. I can look down on it or I can walk around it. In my mind, I don't rotate the, the, the object. I, I might be like a drone flying over it. Or, so, I, or I'm walking around it, walking through it. I can do top down, but not all at once. I've got to do top down or walk around it. So what do you do first, Temple? Well, when I draw a drawing, yeah, it's going to be the aerial view because I got well, when I do a drawing, I got to do the aerial view, the layout. The first thing I got to do is I got to do the layout first. So that's top down, looking down at the cattle handling facility. You would do that first. But then when I start drawing the details, the details of the steel fencing, the details of the concrete floor, then I'm then I'm on the ground looking at it. If I'm doing a fence de detail, showing how the rods are attached to a fence, for example, um, I'm be standing beside it, and I'm even seeing the little clips they use to fasten the uh, the rods to the posts. Amazing. So you don't. Ch it's not like it's a model in front of you and that you no, no, walk I, around. I, 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 in fact, I can't do that. I can't do that. I have well, to. I have to move myself around it. Interesting. And an important difference there. I'm not yeah. that good on rotating the objects in space. No, I walk around it, or I would fly over it. And we had a we had a, another question. Tariq said, uh, "You said that you have a visual brain, but are there other types of brains?" Yeah. I don't think my son is visual, and I want to understand that. Okay, let's talk about in autism. You tend to have more extreme, you know, skill in one area, deficit somewhere else. Okay, I'm what's called an object visualizer, and that uh, object visualizer is is the kind of thinking that's shown in the movie, in the HBO movie. And then there's the visual spatial. This is your mathematical mind. These are your computer programmers, your physicists, your chemists. 
my kind of mind going to be mechanics, uh, uh, mechanical equipment designers, uh, graphic design and art. That's my kind of mind. See, mechanics and art actually go together and music and math go together. And then the third type is the word thinker. This is the kid that knows every baseball statistic or some other thing like that. They're often very good at things like specialized retail where they, they okay, like the auto parts guy, he knew the number for every part in the store. You know, that it's verbal. And then regular people that are verbal thinkers are very top down, very abstract. And like, okay, how do we get businesses to uh, work with people with autism? Well, that's very abstract. Where my approach to thinking is, all right, let's look at some successful things. I mean, the food safety lab, for example, has had one really good success. They have more than one lab in this country. And then they would might want to hire another person. You see that, but you see that's more local, much more specific. Let me tell you some things that bosses need to do. Do not burden a person with autism or an autistic person with long strings of verbal information. I cannot remember. Like the procedure for receiving the samples, for example, you need to make a checklist. Step one. Okay, step one is probably uh, verify the uh, origin of the bottom come in by Federal Express. So look at the label and see where it came from. Probably be the first step. And you've got to make you know, when you take the FedEx wrapping off, be the next step. Now you've got an inner box and you've got to be very careful. See, I'm seeing it because I've seen these samples. Mm -hmm. I, I've got to be careful when I open that inner box so I don't uh, get you know any of the stuff that might be there in there on other things. I got to be very careful about that. So you have steps. Check the label take the outer packaging off, then how you open the inner package, how you label the sample. There's probably about 10 things that are going to be on the checklist for each sample. And it's like a pilot's checklist. I have to have that. Any task with multiple steps, don't, don't tell me how to do it verbally. I need a checklist. The other thing is, I'm not going to work on multitasking jobs. Where, the, you know, and I can think of like Christmas wrapping station, busy takeout window, some chaotic store at Christmas time, that kind of stuff doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Rachel wants to know who have you been most excited to meet in your life? And if you could meet anyone that you haven't met, who would it be? Well, I certainly would like to meet, you know, Elon Musk. I'd like to meet him. I actually met Jeff Bezos a long, long time ago at a techie conference. How fun. I sat yeah. at the same table with him at dinner. And Still that's before I, I, I think it was, the rock, his rocket program had hardly started at that point. So you've never met Elon Musk? No, I haven't. I, you know, and and um, he gets a lot of stuff done. Now he's, I think, based on what I've read in Ashley Vance's book, visual thinker with some math. You see, a lot of people mm -hmm. are mixtures. I think a visual thinker first. I, I Ashley Vance wrote some stuff about his programming skills. He could program, but he wasn't like a super duper superstar of programming. And you know how he wants his stuff to look really nice. Yes. Yeah. Spacesuits made by a costume designer. Yes. yes. Yeah. I love it. Do you see I that? Uh, a launch pad that looks like a movie set. Yes. I I love that. I and love he also it. did it without spending a lot of money. That launch pad has a standard commercial elevator in it. Those are not that expensive. <laughs> but he made the jet bridge that goes out to the to the capsule look like a space odyssey. I thought yes. that was so cool. I, I, I did too. I absolutely love that about it because everything has that look to it. It's very exciting. Uh, Jessica says, our son is seven and loves trains. What can we do with him now to help ha get him ready for a job? Some of which you talked about earlier, but. Oh, maybe... trains. There's a ton of careers in trains. Be happy. He's interested in trains. Visual thinkers can design them, fix them. That's what visual thinkers can do with trains. The mathematical thinkers, there's a lot of engineering stuff on trains where you need the mathematical engineers. The word thinker, um, I knew a guy when I went to college and he wanted to run a big downtown bus station. And I'm pretty sure he was spectrum and word thinker. Well, working on running at the station and making sure the stations run right. You know, that's, um, so there's a job for everybody. So let's take that train interest and let's expand it. Use it to teach reading. Let's read some really interesting books about the railroads. Um, use it to teach math. 
get a train into that. Yeah. Use it to, to teach all kinds of things. No, I'd be happy if my kids are interested in trains because there's so many good careers. The other thing that I'm realizing is I spent 25 years involved with heavy commercial construction. And it's totally affected how I think because I would sell a job, design it, supervise this construction, start it up. It's all about outcomes, finished projects that work, outcomes. And I put a lot of emphasis on careers because we do a really good job. We can get a, um, a person launched into a really good career that they are going to like. Uh, one of the people in Different Not Less in this book, um, she got a job with a computer company and she says, I'm with my people. You know, yeah. that's the kind of thing because there's other people on the autism spectrum in, in computer companies, a lot of them. Whenever people write in though and say, I don't, I don't know, my kid has a passion and I don't know what to do with it, or I don't know what my kid's passion is. I'll tell you, I recommend your Calling All Minds book, Temple. Oh yeah. This is the book. This is the book where I would spend hours playing around with little parachutes, with little um, uh, kites, bird kites and things, making things. I think one of the biggest problems today is kids are totally removed from the world of the practical. And these kids are going to be tomorrow's policymakers. They don't have any idea how supply chain management. We get a lot of stuff from a lot of foreign countries on a container ship. I had a student that didn't even know what a container ship was. Mm. And I'm mm. going, and we're going to be making policy about this stuff in the future? Or they talk about green energy. Well, how do you actually do it? You see, see, none of that stuff is abstract. I mean, I see the windmills. I see solar panels. Yeah, and right now there's a shortage of material that solar panels are made out of. You see that, and, and when I see a solar panel, when I say that, and I see a factory where they're being made, and I read a lot of business magazines because I find this stuff really interesting, so I read about that stuff. Love it. Dee Dee wants to know, is there a children's book about autism you recommend for us to read to our kids on the spectrum and their siblings? How old are kids? Well, and they don't say, but let's, well, let's start with young kids. Really young kids. Uh, there's a book that Future Horizons puts out. That's a real a book for real little children, like Temple did it. You can too. And there's Cy Montgomery's the, the Girl Who Loved Cows. That'd be for older older elementary school. Some of those kids could read it themselves. Those would be uh, good books. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them now that are available. Um, but we got to get kids out doing things. Yeah. You know, people say, well, everything in the in the future is going to be digital. Well, you think, okay, you could have a computerized crane that takes a container off a ship, but it's still a crane. Yeah. Uh, it might be controlled by a computer. It's still a mechanical device. Well, and what happens when it breaks? Well, then we need people to fix it. Yeah. And yeah. this is a major problem. Okay, going back to the article I just read about, there's two Fukushima nuclear power plants, the one that had the horrible mess. Yeah. And the other one that was destroyed, but they contained all the bad radiation. And you know what they I read? I just read in this article that I was trying to get printed before I went on your show. Um, it would have been very helpful if some of the workers at the plant knew how to operate construction equipment, cranes and the big diggers. Yeah. You know what they went and did? They all went out and learned how to operate those and got licenses. There you go. Well, that, you go. Uh, that's it. You see, because in that emergency, they couldn't get a generator off a truck because he didn't know how to operate any of the stuff. Yeah. Gary wants to know, how did you find out that you were on the spectrum? And do you have any advice for how we should tell our 11-year-old daughter? Well, I had severe speech delay. So it was obvious that there was something wrong with me. And, and I was born in 47. I went to a neurologist. Uh, they didn't even know what autism was. They just diagnosed me as brain damage, checked my hearing, and checked for epilepsy. And both of those were negative, and she referred me to a fabulous early intervention speech therapy school that two teachers did out of their little bitty house. Mm -hmm. uh, they just did it on their own, and they were really good. Um, then you have the kid that gets diagnosed you know, around 10, no friends. Mm. Um, Sometimes that's that's a relief. Now, if the kid's doing just fine, I probably wouldn't tell them, okay. because because I don't want them to. Just you don't want to get label. Label. I'm seeing too much. 
of getting completely locked in the label. There we go. Sam wants to know, what does Temple love about teaching and how did she first begin to teach? Well, when I did my very first teaching lecture, I panicked and walked out. Mm. That happened the very first time. Mm. And what I learned was have really good slides or really good notes. If I have to do a talk without slides, I, I need bullet points. So if I get stuck and freeze, I just go on to the next bullet point. But, but there's I, a lot of things you're passionate about, Temple. But one of the things I've known over the years of knowing you is that you're passionate about teaching. What do you? What is it that makes you love teaching? Well, I like seeing students learning. It makes me really happy when a student comes up to me like 10 years later and so they took my class and helped them with their cattle. Yeah. Or, one of the first... The first time I met you, that I wasn't. We were we had filmed the whole thing, and at the end, I said to you, "How long are you going to keep teaching? Are you, you know, you were probably just getting into the window where you could consider retirement?" And I said, "Are you going to stop teaching and just tour and talk about autism?" And I I will never forget what you said to me. You said, "Oh no 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 no, I'll never stop teaching. I do I teach. This is what I do for myself as a woman." was the way, the phrase that you said. Well, and it's, it's, I, uh, being a professor is my, my first identity and autism is very important, but it's not my total identity. And I think it's really important. The uh, reason I put so much emphasis on career things and teaching as a career thing is that that gives me satisfaction. Um, how do we, um, I, you know, I also, also learned even on getting people to handle cattle better is to work on a positive way. I would write all these articles in the trade press on how to handle cattle. Instead of just complaining about how awful it was, well, this is how you do it right. Yeah, wonderful. Give people practical information on how to do things right. I love that. Hattie wants to know, do you have a best friend and what do you like to do with your friends? And then in addition to that, how do you recommend we foster friendships for our 16 year old? He likes cars. He likes cars. Mm -hmm. Let's join a car club. I'm now seeing a specific one. We were doing an animal welfare auditor training in Fremont, Nebraska, and there was a classic car club rally going on in the shopping center. We went to check it out and then bring their you know, like 1940, 1950s, 1960s cars there, all prettied up and they show them off. That's a car club. Um, again, friends who shared interests. Okay, you want the top-down generality? It's friends who shared interests. You want the specifics? A car club would be something specific. Okay. Another teacher started a Star Wars club. Mm. And then the other kids joined it and that for the aut autistic kid liked Star Wars. See, that's a specific example. I can't emphasize enough friends who shared interests. There's a lot of things you can do with cars. Sure. Okay, what does he do? Does, um, you know, when I was a child, when I was a teenager, we had all these little battery operated race cars. That's something you can do with other people. Love it. Do you, uh, do you want to answer the question about what you like to do with your friends now? And do you have a best friend? Is that a thing for you? Well, I've definitely, some of my students are some of my best friends. Mm. And one of the things I have, we'll, we'll have dinner and we'll talk about how their career is going. I really like doing that. Um, so, you know, they, I want to help that my student to be successful. Love it. I've got several that I've uh, like to talk to them about, you know, how their job is going. And I basically, I've been a consultant for so many years that um, it's kind of the same whether I'm talking about autism or I'm talking about something to do with the livestock industry. Yeah. Well, Carla asked the question, does Temple ever mentor? I, I imagine that would be an incredible thing. I'm, I'm guessing you mentor your students. Yeah, I do. And one of the things we do is we have a I try to have a dinner with them like once a week and talk to them and and uh, I want to get my students graduated. I also want to work really hard on getting them launched into decent jobs. That's what a, really important. What a lovely thing for those students. I love this question. Zary says this might be a strange question, but have you ever had someone doubt that you were on the spectrum? Our son has made so much progress that people often tell us that he must have been misdiagnosed, but they have no idea how hard he has worked. It's frustrating. Has that ever happened to you, Temple, where somebody's doubted that you 
Well, the thing that stops it with me is I had severe speech delay. And nobody can deny that. I didn't talk until age four. So I obviously had something wrong with me. But then you have the kids where there's no speech delay. Mm -hmm. You see, autism is a true continuum. When does slightly geeky become autism? It's a true continuous trait because the same genes that give people a big brain also uh, are involved with, with autism. It's an embedded trait. You're not going to get rid of it because the same genetic code that grows this gigantic computer we've got sitting up here uh, involved with autism and schizophrenia. Autism, you may get an overgrowth of, of uh, brain circuits for something like art or mathematics. Schizophrenia, you get kind of a skimpy network. And then unfortunately, in late adolescence, it falls apart, mm. which is yeah. bad. Yes. They're opposite he traits, actually. There we go. Pete wrote in and said, I'm, neuro I'm neurodivergent and I hate when parents find out. They stare at me and watch everything I do and they ask stupid questions like, do I remember my childhood? I find it annoying. Do you ever get annoyed when people ask you stupid questions and how do you deal with it? Well, I have plenty of customers to do the same thing and you just answer them. That's what you do. The other thing I learned on starting off my business was showing my work. I learned to sell my work instead of myself. We need to short circuit and get rid of some of the regular interview and be able to go in and show work. You know, and I would just um, hold up, here's a drawing and a project I designed that's in, in thinking and pictures. And when people saw my drawings, they were amazed. I would sell the work. I think on a lot of job placements, we need to work with employers to give uh, someone a free tr you know, time to like come in and improve themselves. Also, another thing on certain jobs, let's take receiving the samples at the food safety lab. Uh, the autistic person may have taken longer to train, but when he's trained, he's going to be better. Yeah. He will not mix them up and he will not cross contaminate them. And that's super go. important if you're running a food safety lab. Yeah. Addie's written in and said, I'm concerned about high school students who have lost so much in, in COVID. As a college professor, I'm interested to know what you think we should be doing to get these kids caught up and ready for college or jobs. Well, I've got to get a little more specific here. One thing I've noticed, we had three semesters of online at my university. We did the first live classes this fall. I can't get these students to talk in class. <sighs> That mm -hmm. has gotten, and it was in my class, and we just did an ag careers class yesterday. Can't get these kids to talk. And I think that's, you know, made things, that's not good. Yeah. Because learning how to just do, you know, like basic communication like that, I know. You know, I learned that because when I was seven, mother got me and my sister dressed up in good clothes, and we had to greet the guests at parties and talk to them. That was done. Every kid in the neighborhood, they did that doesn't cost any money. Now look back on it and it taught really great social skills, taught how to talk to grownups. My brother hated those parties and he admitted that they helped him land jobs, high level bank jobs. Because yeah. he wanted to talk to grownups, the older men. It's interesting that you should say that though, Temple, because I, I know for me and a lot of other adults that don't identify ourselves as being neurodivergent, there's a phrase that we've all started saying, which is, I. it's like I forgot how to do people in person. I forgot how to do small talk. I forgot how to negotiate when one friend wants to go here for dinner and another friend wants to go here. It's it's like those skills in me ha like went by the wayside and I got to resharpen them. But as you say, I, you know, I hadn't really thought about it before that students have gotten used to think that education is this passive thing where they're, a screen is on and they're doing something else and sort of listening. What, besides doing a thing at home? Well, you just froze. Hello? Or we get yeah, you froze. Don't move so much. Got okay. Move it down. You just froze. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. Okay. Uh, but so what can we do for the, for the teachers to get them back to interaction? Well, I'm finding I'm having to drag it out of them. Like in this class yesterday, I had about three students that really engaged. And some of the others, I just started calling on them. That's what you're going to have to do. Because this is basic stuff. 
there's a scene in the movie where I went up and I got the editor's card you know, so I could write for the magazine. That's a very important scene. I saw that door and then I delivered a really good article. You know what else I'm seeing on my regular students, not mm. neurodivergent, awful writing skills. Mm. And then mm. when I, not talking about handwriting, just writing composition, you know, you know, just compose a decent business letter, compose a one page proposal for something. Tell me how you raised your pigs, just basic stuff. And, mm. and uh, I'm finding out they've never written book reports. They've never had the work marked up, but I've talked to a lot of professors about this and there's college students now awful writing skills yeah. and I can tell you that good writing skills were really important for me because I wrote about my cattle handling projects Absolutely. and I how, many, write, how, many, and, how many books do you have Temple well I have used co-authors for a lot of books now thinking in pictures and the way I see it, it's all my writing that's all mm -hmm. totally my writing but for other books getting more complicated I need that verbal person to uh, keep it organized you see, that's an example of the different minds working together. I love it. Where, uh, where um, I, uh, you know, this is where, okay, Deborah Moore, for example, is very verbal. And I'm learning more about how the verbal person is very different from me. The verbal mind overgeneralizes. I, this mm -hmm. drives me nuts on disability stuff. You put in all the disabilities together. I'm seeing my blind roommate, somebody in a wheelchair, somebody that's fully verbal, somebody who's not all put together, they all have very different needs. You see, when you think bottom up, that doesn't even make any sense. A wheelchair, a person in a wheelchair needs an accessible building. That's something that's very different. I, I, I love looking at it from, from, from your point of view. It just makes so much sense. We're running out of time, so I wanna to get to this question. Nan says, parents are highly impacted are asking there for there to be a new designation for their kids because the term autism is too big of an umbrella. Oh, and they ridiculous. want to know what you I think it's ridiculous how big of an umbrella it was. Yeah. See, originally you had to have speech delay, early childhood speech delay to be diagnosed as autistic. Then they added the Asperger's in the early 90s. So now you had that in there with uh, no obvious speech delay, socially awkward, no obvious speech delay. Then 2013 they merge all this stuff together yeah. so now you've got elon musk einstein me in the same category with someone with very severe epilepsy mobility issues and nonverbal. and then you have partially verbal then you've got some nonverbals i want to emphasize there are some nonverbals that can't control their movements they type independently and they got a brain inside there you might want to read tito makapata hey how can i talk if my lips don't move but it's just ridiculous because um, and then I'm seeing here's bad examples of really bad stuff at school. I don't want to see. OK, let's say you've got a fifth grader that's fully verbal, smart, good at math, and he's put in an in a autism class with nonverbal children. That's totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Another thing I see totally wrong, you got a, a kid in second grade, super good at math and they don't move them head. If he can do a college algebra book in second grade, fine. I'm not, and he needs to be doing it. I'm not suggesting putting them in, in high school, bring those more, you know, grown up materials down to his classroom. He could do it on a computer. And now I'm visualizing my old classroom and, and that laptop, he'd be turned around where I could see the laptop if I was the teacher, make sure the math program was up, even if I didn't understand it. And he was going oh. through it. Temple, we're out of time, but I hate that because it's just so enjoyable to get to spend this time with you. I just, I don't know if you know how much we all respect and admire you and how, how much you've helped all of us to be able to see a path and how much hope you've given all of us, how much clarity you've given all of us. It's just your contribution to our community is so vast. Well, so thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and and can you hold up your new book one more time so we can it's see right the here more? navigating navigating autism and so everybody needs to get this you can get this at any uh, major bookseller you can get it's available right now I know somebody wrote in and said they just got the audio version of it that's coming out I guess like uh, to, on a Tuesday lot. <laughs> a lot of people love audio I got the royalty check for thinking in pictures this year one third of it was audio. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that. I was really surprised. Um, and, yeah. 
really, but, really surprised. I'm interested in talking to you more about the um, uh, this other designation they want to do. What are they proposing to call it? Uh, I don't know that they've come up with a term yet, but these parents are saying that it's just it's not serving their kids when when it's all lumped together. Because I would agree with it. I would totally agree with that. Yeah, because you see, you see, then you you know, I did a parent group on the specific genetic uh, disorder with very severe epilepsy along with autism, um, and this is very different. Can I tell you what's holding it back, though, is that there is a there's a portion of the community that's so afraid that if you if if you make another designation for for more severe and challenges, that it's going to stop uh, allowing for funding for people who are on the the Asperger end of things who have enjoyed getting some good intervention. So well, that's, that's, a valid, the, that's a valid concern. And this yes. is where I'm learning about verbal thinking. Verbal thinking has. Uh, you know, they'll talk about inclusiveness or we'll talk about green energy, you know, big, broad concepts. They don't have any idea how to implement it. So that's a valid concern. That's a valid concern. So maybe that I'm not going to go out and lobby to change that. I want to talk about, uh, you know, how to how to deal with things individually, like in a school or whatnot. And yeah. it was a very big revelation for me when I discovered that some people didn't think in pictures. But I'm also, it's been a been a very insightful to me to learn just how much the really verbal, regular person, neurotypical person overgeneralizes. Yes. Over and over and over again. I don't care if it's autism, dog behavior, or horse behavior. Yes. And you right. do it with all of them. You're absolutely right. And okay, disability. We got wheelchairs and blindness and deafness and autism and and ADHD altogether. Yeah, doesn't make sense. Now, maybe I can see why they do that. For funding purposes, I can see why they do that. And that's a legitimate reason for doing it. And it's fine to do it for that reason. But then when we're, when we're working in the individual classroom or whatever, that's where we need to be realizing that these kids are really different. Yeah, They're individuals. The, with the funding is that the, who do you think does the funding? The verbal thinkers. Politicians are verbal thinkers. Yeah. Yes. I have no idea how to implement stuff. <laughs> You're absolutely right. But that's the problem. And I'm beginning to realize that we need all the different team. I'm very concerned because of my inability to do math that I'm getting, you know, that my kind of mind is getting screened out of graduating high school. I don't think that's, I could get through college today. That's but horrible. You need, you need us to prevent a mess like Fukushima. Water type story would have saved it. Yes. I just read this paper today about fish swimming in the basement. <laughs> I'm going to be picturing that all day, Temple. Yeah, I, right. I just I smashed outdoors. The site's flooded. It sounds like something out of a Monty Python film where, where the guy's on the phone and saying, uh, we've got fish swimming, <laughs> right? It almost sounds comic. It's crazy. Uh, I so enjoy talking to you, Temple. I just adore you. Uh, we are out of time, but people are writing in and saying, let's do this again, part two, three, and four. I do want to let people know that we've been able to do many interviews with you. We, we will rerun this interview on Tuesday's show. You can typically tune in on Tuesdays. Uh, most Tuesdays, we, we call it Temple Grand and Tuesday. And, and a lot of times we'll have, when we can, we have Temple or we play interviews that we've done with her before. They're just so luscious. So do check that out, but do get Temple's new book navigating autism and of course you know what is it 11 books now that you're at temple 11 oh, no, no, well then i have then i have my textbooks too now oh, you want to look so at many. stuff that i did all the writing on my textbooks i love it chapters i did in livestock handling and transport here's my book on improving animal welfare practical approach I was you get so much done my, but, the, but the chapters in this book there's no co-author my technical stuff if you go look up my I mean, obviously, I have papers where students are co-authors, but I've got uh, academic papers where, no, it's my writing. And the chapters in here, it's all my writing for my real technical stuff. You are prolific, uh, absolutely prolific. So we, we adore you, and we hope that uh, to have you back again really soon. Thank you for taking the time to be with us, Dr. Grandin. It was great to talk to you today. Thank you so much. All right. You take care. I will. I'm going to leave the meeting right now. Thank you right. so much. And okay. I'm going to say...
Bye bye. Bye. I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna say to everybody that uh, we'll be back on Monday. I hope you enjoyed today. I know I did. We'll be back on Monday. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.